morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, this is Mark Collier with OpenStack Foundation, and um, we're excited to have another webinar. And more, more interestingly, we're excited to have a new release of OpenStack. I'm sure most of you know uh, a new version comes out every six months with uh, the hard work of many, many people. I want to talk to some of those folks today that are joining me on the webinar and uh, talk about what's in the release and what it means to users and also answer any questions that the audience may have as we go along. So feel free anywhere along the way here to um, pop questions into the uh, Bright Talk webinar system and uh, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can as we go along. So Juno is the 10th release, hard to believe, uh, in just over four years the community has been able to produce uh, 10 releases. And to start with, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the highlights, and then we're going to try to get quickly uh, to asking Kyle and Andrew, who are joining me on the webinar, some questions about it and get their point of view. So Kyle Mestri is a Senior Director and Chief Technologist of Open Source Networking at HP. He's also the Project Technical Lead for the Neutron Project OpenStack Networking. So uh, you can certainly um, direct your toughest networking questions at Kyle, and I'll quickly deflect them to him. Um, uh, and we've also got Andrew Mitri, who's an architect at Comcast. They're one of the largest OpenStack clouds uh, out there um, that they are running their business on, and we always love to hear from users, um, and not just uh, those of us who are involved in OpenStack every day uh, working on building it, but also, you know, really hear from those people that are using it, find out what they like and don't like and how they see the new release, um, how they think about evaluating each new version and what, what goes into that. So we wanted to start with a quick poll, and um, the question was really how familiar are you, are you with OpenStack? And um, there's a, vo a voting system that's part of this webinar platform. And I have uh, just started the, the poll. Um, so you can actually click uh, inside the, the webinar um, app. Wow, we're getting tons of votes already. So really just wanted to know, you know, if you're just kind of hearing about OpenStack or if you're actively evaluating it or if you're already running it. Uh, maybe some other, other scenarios or other categories, but as we go along, that'll help us kind of get a sense for who all is in the audience and your familiarity with, with OpenStack. Um, now, I know that probably a few people are, are here just learning about it for the first time. So at a very high level, you know, OpenStack is a cloud platform. It helps you manage your compute, storage, and networking um, throughout your data center. really helps automate that. It includes a, a dashboard, both for administrators who are operating the clouds, um, you know, folks like Andrew at Comcast, and the end users, the developers who want to provision those resources also can do so through a self-service dashboard. So at a high level, you know, that's what OpenStack is all about, and, you know, businesses really use it to move a lot faster, to give their developers the resources they need to be creative, to create value, new features, get them to market faster, than uh, sort of the pre-cloud era of, you know, opening a ticket and waiting, you know, weeks to get a new machine online just so you can start hacking on a, an app idea you have. You know, that can happen in minutes now with all the enterprises adopting um, cloud and OpenStack is, is there to help that transition. And, you know, with the 10th release, uh, one of the things that continues to be Front and center for users is how wide of uh, support um, the platform has for different technologies. So by that we mean you know, things like drivers. Um, there were almost 100 drivers that were tested uh, throughout the, the development process of uh, creating Juno that are included in the Juno release. Um, and there are many other drivers uh, available from, from all of the top tier vendors uh, from compute storage and networking. And, of course, we see people using it in many different industries. Um, you know, some of the themes that we see uh, Juno really um, hitting on are enterprise maturity. So, you know, because we have a lot of plugins and driver support, that means that it works in very diverse environments. 
Um, some of the improvements in the object storage around storage policies really help uh, with enterprises that maybe have different classes of data and they want to store it in different um, regions or at different levels of um, redundancy, depending on you know, how critical it is that they have uh, X number of copies. A lot of, a lot of um, improvements in the identity side to make it easier to plug into LDAP and also to federate identity across different environments. Um, you know, NFB is something we'll be talking about a little bit later, which is a new buzzword, if you haven't heard it, uh, that comes from the telco world of network functions virtualization. And then, last but not least, um, the biggest new overall capability that was added in with this integrated release was the data processing capability. And this is really for things like Hadoop that many users were already running on OpenStack. Um, They're now able to do that within the OpenStack dashboard and really help create different node pools, different cluster templates, and quickly spin up, um, you know, worker nodes and control nodes and help run jobs and do all that from inside of the OpenStack dashboard. So for people that were uh, interested in running things like Hadoop um, on OpenStack, you know, that is now a lot easier thanks to this new Juno um, capability. Uh, one of the things that is really key to how we as a community approach developing OpenStack is that we always want to have as much user involvement as possible. This is not like traditional software that might be developed uh, in a a very closed manner by one company and then uh, kind of trotted out on stage at, uh, you know, the Moscone Center and sort of force-fed to the the people in attendance. You know, this is uh, much more about getting users involved. We've had uh, ops summits. Um, I was really lucky to attend an op summit in San Antonio back in August where we had users from you know, Comcast, Time Warner Cable, GoDaddy, Yahoo, and there's a whole list here you can see. But you know, these are all people that not only are running OpenStack, but they really care about the future of OpenStack and they're helping drive the direction of it. And that's a big part of how we got to Juno and how we do things in OpenStack to make sure the software really meets the needs of, of the end users. Um, People are always interested in the, st- the stats. Um, you know, over 1,400 people contributed to Juno, which was even more than Ice House. Um, you know, I think at, at some point um, you kind of lose track of how many features when you get over 300 um, to kind of uh, too many to, to list. But um, we also s- certainly saw um, a lot more activity in the bug fixing area, and I think that's a testament to how many people are running in production and helping identify um, different issues that, that were, um, you know, brought forward and fixed in Juno. And, you know, there were also some really cool statistics that, uh, that I didn't put on the slide, but um, Jeremy Stanley, who is one of the members of the OpenStack infrastructure team, was, uh, was letting me know just, just how massive the testing infrastructure has become. You know, we have over uh, almost 100 third-party testing systems plugged in that help verify all those drivers that I was talking about. And uh, we actually saw, just in the six-month time, almost 20,000 changes merged. And, you know, that includes not just OpenStack, but a whole host of things that the cloud computing industry cares about that the infrastructure team um, is kind enough to help manage and facilitate um, as part of the infrastructure and actually uh, over 18 terabytes of log data was generated uh, through the process of all that testing. So pretty amazing scale for a distributed team that's uh, really not driven by one company. It's really a community-led effort. And so um, the number of contributors has become so massive that uh, you really can't put them on one slide, although we tried. Um, But just want to thank all those contributors um, that that made this possible, and I really hope that we're able to, uh, they're all able to come to our next summit in Paris in a couple of weeks. So um, the summits are a great place for all the developers and users to get together. So with that intro out of the way, um, I wanted to throw some questions out to my guests on the call today. So uh, I guess we'll start with Andrew Mitri from Comcast. Um, what do you see are some of the most significant changes um, in Juno coming from the Ice House world? So um, I think we see uh, a few different things that we're really excited about. <clears throat> First is uh, uh, 
being a large uh, service provider, having IPv6 support uh, baked into uh, Neutron is something that uh, we we're excited about, and we were excited to kind of participate and lead uh, the sub team on that effort um, and uh, and see it come to fruition there. Um, also, uh, some of the you know new services that are coming up with NFV and also uh, the big data of the Sahara, like you mentioned. Um, we've actually had a lot of our internal uh, teams ping us about, oh, when are you releasing Sahara? When can we leverage this? When can we do that? Um, so that's been generating a lot of interest where they're, they're actually, you know, uh, it's probably one of the first times that uh, our internal teams are tracking OpenStack and saying, hey, I need this feature. When can you get it deployed? So we're getting a lot of internal interest there as well. Um, oh, also, uh, yeah, and and lastly is the uh, you know just the uh, the live upgrades and the better stability and and uh, enterprise you know kind of enterprise integration with Keystone and and all those services uh, as we mature and scale out the platform. We're excited to see those come. Okay, great. And Kyle, I know you're um, you've been living and breathing the networking uh, Neutron project, so um, I'm sure that that's near and dear to your heart, but, uh, you know, overall, I guess, um, would love to hear your perspective on kind of what makes Juno such a big relief for OpenStack and the user base. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think one of the, the main features on the Neutron side for Juno that, that the team has worked really hard on was the distributed virtual router support, um, which is otherwise known as DVR. And this was important because as a team, the Neutron team really tried to focus in Juno on, on, um, on, on parity with Nova Network, which is something we've been working on, you know, stability and parity with Nova Network. And we, we really, we really achieved that during Juno now. And DVR was one of the key features for that. And at a high level, what DVR lets you do is it, it lets you move the, the routing functionality to each compute host. And it also moves the, the DNAT functionality down there as well. So th this was a pretty huge feature, and, and we'd really love to see users um, provide a lot of feedback for this in Juno. Um, the team is going to be working to, to expand support for this um, in, during the Kilo development time frame as well. And, you know, one of the other things that I'd like to mention is one of the big changes that, that we saw was, you know, we, we really tried to involve operators a lot more during the Juno cycle. This, this was, you know, facilitated partially by the the ops meetup, which you had mentioned before. And specifically, you know, when we were looking at migrating Nova networking users to Neutron, we as developers and engineers spent a lot of time thinking about that. We came up with some prototypes. We worked through some examples. But it was really key to us to, to kind of get input from the users and the operators. And so the ops meetup was really key from that perspective. So it, it was a very useful experience for, for us as on the engineering side. Yeah, that's great. I, I think um, – I'm glad you brought up the Ops Meetup again because um, I know that Comcast had quite a few folks involved there. And Andrew, were you able to to attend the Ops Meetup, or what was the the kind of impact for you, your team from that? I was kind there of along with uh, with I was there along with some of my team, and, and actually we find the Ops Meetup uh, beneficial in a couple different ways, not just in, in interacting with the developers and giving feedback there and kind of having a back and forth there but also interacting with other operators and, and kind of learning best practices and how they make things work at, the, at at a larger scale and what challenges they have, how they solve those challenges. So the community around it is actually really valuable for us. Uh, um, uh, it's definitely uh, one of the events we really look forward to uh, uh, every uh, every cycle. And, um, uh, you know, I think it helped us build a relationship more directly with those developers so that, uh, hey, now we can put a name with uh, a face with that name and reach out over IRC or whatnot uh, or reply to a thread uh, and understand what the context was there. That's great. And, and for anybody out there who's not aware, um, you know, we do, we've started more regularly having these ops meetups for users um, in between summits, but we're also doing them at the summit. So there will be um, some breakout sessions dedicated to uh, operator discussions and collaboration, um, you know, at this upcoming summit in Paris. So if you're an operator and you're coming to, to the Paris summit in November, uh, you know, be sure to, to check out those sessions. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And um, I think I want to make sure I pause and encourage people to put questions in the, uh, uh, you know, in the, um, question box, and we'll try to get to those as we go along. So 
Um, how has OpenStack evolved within your organization? Um, you know, this probably applies a little more to Andrew, although I'm sure um, Kyle recently uh, joining HP is probably aware that uh, they run quite a bit of OpenStack as well. But, um, but Andrew, do you have any uh, insight you can share on kind of how uh, that's evolved over time? Yeah, uh, sure. So, uh, you know, we started uh, looking at OpenStack back in, in, in 2012, uh, and, and did our first, you know, small kind of proof of concept production deployment at the end of 2012. Now, um, I, I think we demoed X1 on OpenStack in, in the spring of 2013 uh, and was doing production traffic with our set-top boxes there. In the past year or since then, or almost year and a half now, we've deployed more than five times the amount of infrastructure. We've kind of become the de facto uh, in-house cloud provider within Comcast, and, and we've changed, uh, we've had kind of a paradigm shift where, our products used to, uh, you know, deploy infrastructure uh, just for their product, kind of all in one vertical. And and okay. now the okay. default option is let's go deploy on this multi-tenant platform that we've rolled out within Comcast. Um, we can get our products out to market faster. A lot of wins because we can now – we don't have to wait for infrastructure. We spin up uh, compute and storage on demand. Um, and so uh, we can do things like support events that need infrastructure just for a short amount of time, like the Olympics or the World Cup spin up a lot of infrastructure and then spin it back down and use that for something else. So it's uh, it's really helped us evolve uh, the, the cloud paradigm within Comcast. Wow, so the Olympics or the World Cup, those are, I've heard of those. Those are pretty uh, yeah. pretty important um, pieces of infrastructure hanging out in the background trying to deliver that to a lot of, a lot of wild fans all over the world. So that's pretty, that's pretty awesome that OpenStack can have some, some part in that. So um, we did have a question uh, from the audience, and I think this would be um, a good one for Kyle. So uh, this user um, or audience member asked uh, that, uh, you know, a lot of users uh, seem to be using Nova Network, which for those of you who aren't familiar, there's really two ways to configure networking in OpenStack. There's Nova Network, which is the sort of legacy networking capability built into the Nova project, and then there's the uh, Neutron, the more forward looking kind of direction. And so the question was, you know, there are a lot of users using Nova Network that aren't planning to start using Neutron. Do you see this changing with Juno? What needs to be done to facilitate this transition? This is this is definitely a frequently asked question I hear from users, and we heard it at the Ops Summit. So maybe you can shed some light on that for us, Kyle. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think you're right. This, this is obviously a pretty hot topic. And, you know, both teams, the Nova team, and the Neutron team, you know, spent significant time over the Icehouse and Juno timeframes on this. And in fact, we entered the Juno development cycle with a charter from the technical committee to close this parity gap. And the team did a spectacular job in, in closing that. So the one area where we really didn't close it was on the migration plans. And as I touched on earlier, you know, we, we really wanted to get some more input from users on that because that was the one thing we were lacking. So I expect during the Kilo time frame, you know, we'll, we'll try to move forward on migration uh, strategy there. Um, you know, my, my general consensus was that it, it was hard for us to get a lot of data around who's using Nova Network versus who's using Neutron, and that made the migration story a little bit better. So we would certainly love to hear from additional users in this area for people that are using one or the other or that want to migrate from one to the other, that sort of thing as well. Um, so I, I think that what we, that's one thing that we'd really like to help to facilitate this, this migration maybe from new, uh, Nova Network to Neutron. Um, if we could hear from more people, it would help us to be, be able to better plan um, what, what the migration story will look like, I think. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Kyle. And, uh, this is a, a perfect time for me to plug our user survey. So we, uh, we continuously, the foundation and working with a lot of different people in the community, the user committee have – uh, created a user survey where we're constantly collecting insight and input from different users. So if you go to openstack.org slash user survey, you can go in there and it takes about 10 minutes um, to tell us what you're doing with OpenStack. We get data points like, you know, how many people are using Nova Network versus how many people are using Neutron. And what do you think about Neutron or what's, you know, what's the holdup for you to, to make the migration? So that's, that's actually our single bit, biggest kind of 
uh, tool that we have in the toolbox to get that insight. So please go fill that survey out. Um, we've gotten a tremendous number of responses the last few weeks um, because we, we tend to go over the results at the summits. Um, but, you know, we, we're always welcome people to, to fill that out whenever possible. Um, now, we had an, another question um, come in, which is, uh, what are the plans for bringing in Docker support on mainline of OpenStack? And um, I can speak to that um, a little bit, I think. Um, you know, I, I think I just actually caught up with Michael Still yesterday, who's the PTL for Nova, and um, he would certainly be um, the best person to provide kind of the, the, the most recent details. But the way he explained it to me was that, um, you know, Docker support um, is very strong at this point um, through uh, the StackForge uh, hosted drivers. And um, so there is some interest, I think, in bringing it back into being part of, you know, shipping as part of the release, you know, potentially in a future release. Um, it's not the case for Juno. Um, but the good news is that, um, to a certain extent, it, it's kind of semantics as to where, where the code lives. Um, you know, having the, the driver shipped with um, the software certainly means it's passed a lot of QA tests. But uh, on the other hand, if, you're, if it's shipped through um, StackForge, meaning it's not actually shipped with the release, that doesn't mean that it hasn't been tested. So some people, I think, kind of conflate those two things. So, um, you know, when... In this particular case, um, you know, the feedback I've gotten from Michael is that um, there is a lot of activity around Docker. Uh, we certainly know there's tons of interest, and there are multiple ways it can be used with OpenStack, both in a sort of pseudo-hypervisor type of a, a role uh, through the, as a driver in that sense, as well as on top of OpenStack um, guest VMs. You may want to use something like Heat, the orchestration framework, to orchestrate um, the deployment of Docker um, containers on top of OpenStack Cloud. So there are a lot of different layers you can use um, Docker uh, with OpenStack, and there's certainly a tremendous amount of interest. I think there will be a lot of discussions about that at the summit in a couple of weeks, and that was actually why I was uh, catching up with Michael, was to make sure we had uh, everything in place for, for those discussions to, to happen. Um, so hopefully that, that addresses that question. Um, so here's a question that is definitely for Kyle. Um, with the new DVR on Neutron, how, how north-south traffic is going to be managed on OpenStack? Is there going to be a need of an additional edge router for traffic outgoing or incoming the virtual environment? Yeah, definitely. So I, I will say that um, for, for that there's actually a great wiki page that the DVR team put up. Um, I don't know if we can share links here, Mark, or, or not, but, you know, in the background, maybe if someone could let me know, because I can share that it has a lot more detailed information. But, I mean, in summary, the intent of the DVR is to, to do that, that, that. So with regards to the north-south traffic, I, I think that the person maybe means, like, the NATed traffic for floating IPs. And so we can do the DNAT on the host, but the SNAT still is required to be done on a network node. Um, and the, re the main reason for that is, the SMAC requires burning uh, IP addresses per compute node. Now, there, there is some work going on to, to figure out how to possibly do this in an efficient way in Kilo, but it didn't make it into Juno. Um, I will also say, though, that we did land a blueprint around making those network nodes highly available. Um, in other words, making them so you, you essentially have HA with them there. So that actually helps um, in that particular case for the, the SMAC uh, nodes for DVR. Okay, great. Um, and just so you know, Kyle, there, there's a box that says live audience messaging below in the, in the webinar page, and you can drop links in there. So if you've got a wiki link that would be useful for the audience, you know, definitely put it in there. Um, so I perfect. think Thanks, we had um, – what's that? Oh, I was just saying thank you. Yeah, perfect. Oh, cool. So uh, next question was, um, is designate fully integrated into Juno for DNS as a service? So Designate um, is an official project that's um, in the incubation phase. So um, it will be um, in, I assume, a future integrated release, um, but it's not at that state yet for Juno. So it's still um, it's available. The software's there. A lot of people are using it, um, but it's not 
at that phase yet where it was classified as being part of the integrated release. So hopefully, you know, we'll see something along those lines next year. Um, uh, next question was, uh, this is a, a great one. We definitely hear a lot from users, which is about upgrades. And the question was, can you talk more about upgrades from Icehouse to Juno? So um, I could take a stab at that, but I'll, I'll maybe throw that one to Kyle and, and uh, see if you uh, want to take that one. Well, you know, honestly, like it might be worth having Andrew talk a bit about that as well from a user perspective if, if you're comfortable with that. Sure. Um, I mean, I can talk a little bit. So um, we've, uh, you know, right now uh, we're going from Havana to Ice House, and we're just about done with that process, and it's been a lot uh, less painful than previous upgrades. So we're, we're happy that a lot of the feedback is making it through the operators meetup and, and, and the feedback we've been giving there. Um, uh, we haven't made the step yet from Ice House to Juno, so I can't speak as specifically to that, but uh, it does look from everything that we've been monitoring that uh, that should be an even uh, more seamless transition uh, than uh, going from Havana to Ice House. So we're excited about doing it. Um, and we're, we try to maintain a regular release cadence with a goal of eventually getting to be a month uh, off of uh, an official or stable release. Right now we run about yeah. five to six months behind. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I mean, one thing I, I, I can say on the Neutron side with regards to upgrades, in Juno, we we really did a lot of work to clean up our database migration story, um, which definitely will impact upgrades going forward from Juno. And one, I mean, previous to Juno, we had an issue where we did, we had plugin-specific migrations, which which caused, you know, different issues around the item potency of, of, of where you landed. So that was all, you know, we had a team working on that, and they did a great job during the, the summer, and they cleaned all that up. So now in Juno going forward, we do no longer have plugin-specific migration. So I think that's definitely going to be a win for, for people using Neutron. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the database um, piece of that. I know that um, in the past, you know, the uh, from the Nova side with Compute, there was uh, uh, really from Havana to Ice House was the first time it was possible to really do an upgrade without um, impacting, you know, end-user workloads in the compute realm. Um, but, you know, there was, um, it, you know, it was more painful and took more time than it really needed to because of the database migration updates. Um, and so I think that was one of the things that improved from an upgrade perspective on the Nova side from ISELS to Juno, which is, you know, what you were alluding to in Neutron as well, which is all that work to make the database updates, um, you know, faster helps in, in a lot of different realms. Um, so let's see. Uh, another question was, um, how's the IPv6 integration going on? And I know um, that this is this was a, a big part of the Neutron networking story for Juno. So maybe, Kyle, you want to uh, give an update on that? Uh, sorry, Mark. This is around the, the IPv6 stuff. I apologize. Yeah, the IPv6 yeah. Um, improvements. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we had the goal in Juno was to essentially close the gap around IPv6 on on tenant networks. And like Andrew said earlier, you know, Comcast was heavily involved in this. They had someone leading the sub team, and this, this was another example of of great work by by the team. And we we were able to close all the gaps so that you know you'll we now on Neutron so, you know support full IPv6 uh, for tenant networks and everything. And I'm sure I'm sure Andrew can go into much more detail around the, the specifics of, of of that as well, given his team, you know, kind of led that work. Yeah. So we, you know, to be clear, we're actually running uh, V6 uh, via some backports today on Havana in production, um, and uh, all our set-top box traffic and, and email traffic, all that requires V6 today. Uh, and so we do run it today, and we're excited that it is fully supported upstream in Juno. So it works okay, well for thanks. us. Um, yep. So that there was a question um, about installation configuration. You know, there's so many different options out there, Crowbar, um, you know, DevStack, PackStack, and all these other different options. And, you know, maybe this would be an interesting one, Andrew, for you to comment on. Um, I, I don't, I'm sure you haven't had the time to evaluate every possible installation tool, but, um you know, maybe if you can talk about how you guys approach 
you know, picking the right installer or, or talk a little bit about how you guys manage that, that might be useful for this, uh, some of the people in the audience. Yeah, so we've been, we've been running OpenStack for a while. We started off at the time uh, leveraging Puppet because it seemed for us the most uh, mature uh, way of uh, getting OpenStack installed, and that's kind of where we're uh, what we're leveraging today. I think we are very interested in uh, the evolution of uh, Triple O, um, and we're keeping an eye on it, but today we've been kind of focused around uh, just uh, leveraging Puppet, and it's working for us there. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm just kind of uh, going through some of the, the questions here, and I know we had um, a few more in the deck. So um, maybe I, this is a good time to, to ask Kyle to talk a little bit about NFV. Uh, for those of you who don't know about NFV, it's, it's Network Functions Virtualization. Um, we, we discovered there were three letters that hadn't been made into an acronym yet, so we felt like that was a good opportunity to do that. Um, so this is a really about the telco world and trying to virtualize all these functions that happen at the back end of these massive networks that route, you know, all of our cell phone calls and text messages and MMS and trying to make that more of a software uh, defined world for those guys and taking advantage of that. And OpenStack plays a role in that and Neutron as well. So Kyle, can you can you shed some light on, you know, what NFV is about and what role OpenStack is going to play in that uh, new new market? Absolutely. So I think like you said, you know, NFC is, is, is really about virtualizing all of these different network functions and being able to kind of orchestrate them so that you can dynamically spin them up and spin them down. And if it, if it sounds familiar, I think it's a lot of what, you know, the existing server virtualization world was doing. This is applied to kind of um, network appliances or functionality that was done there. And OpenStack is really a natural place for this because we have the orchestration capabilities which are necessary for this, and we also have the capability to, to manage these images, these network functions as their virtual images. We have the networking capability to, to string them together, to spin them up dynamically, um, to place them where they're needed, close to the workloads or, or wherever you want to, to put them. So I think it, that's why it's kind of a natural place. During, during the Juno time frame, there was an NFV sub-team, which was sitting kind of a – it wasn't a sub-team of any particular project. It was a broader team that was focused on all of the different pieces that are involved here. And I know during Juno they spent a lot of time on Nova blueprints, um, doing things that were important for NFV on the Nova side. And, you know, uh, we're already engaged with them on a neutron front because I suspect that that during um, that during the, the Kilo time frame we're going to really focus on what neutron needs uh, for NFV and, and, you know, to enable that from the neutron side. Okay, thanks, Kyle. Um, so, Kyle, there, there was a detailed number of questions um, in the webinar from one of the audience member um, about some specifics in the neutron world, and um, I'm, hopefully you can, you can pull down the, the menu because I don't know if I could uh, read, yeah, read all the details without, uh, without you know, missing a detail, but. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely, I see that question, and they were all around the specific V6, um, V6 apps. Some of this, I'm going to I mean, Andrew, if you could pull it up, too, and if you know, some of these, I'm not sure I know 100%. Um, the Horizon support, I'm not 100% sure on that, so this is the asking about Horizon dashboard support for V6 provisioning, DHCP V6 stateless provisioning. It's, it's possible that that may have lagged a bit, um, uh, so I'm, I would sure. have to go with I mean, go our end here. users are able to, to add V6 addresses into the security groups and, and view them in Horizon today. Um, so. Okay, so that's definitely really good as well. Um, actually, Andrew, you and may actually know the answers to some of these as well. Yeah, I know that one and two, I think, are uh, from a security group in Horizon Dashboard. I, I'm pretty sure that's working right now. In the upstream, um, yeah. Uh, so number uh, number three, the DNS mask enhancement acts as a stateless server. That that did not make it, I, I believe, right? That because I think we I think the RDD yes. support. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did not, that one did not make. It. Yeah. But but I but you know the, the functionality is handled by RADVD, right? Uh, Correct. Yeah. 
And scalability numbers, that I'm not 100% sure on either. I'd have to look that up. So, so, so Mark, some of these things are, that are more specific like this, we, we may take them offline or, or allow people okay. to reach out that way. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have the exact number, but we are running a pretty large uh, quantity of V6 on the infrastructure, um, uh, and we can get stats later. Um, and we do do everything dual stack. We're only doing dual stack right now. Mm -hmm. So dual stack does work. Good. Um, well, um, that that was from a, uh, a very a large cloud provider that's, um, you know, deploying IPv6. So thank you to whoever that anonymous uh, person is because we love uh, – Big cloud, big time cloud providers, um, and you know we'll be hearing from a lot of those um, at our OpenStack summit. And I wanted to hear uh, from Andrew and Kyle, kind of what uh, you're looking forward to in the Paris summit. Is there specific sessions or topics that you think are going to be really critical? You know, really kind of looking forward to Kilo, I guess, which is what we plan in, in the summit. Uh, maybe I'll start with with you, Andrew. You know, do you have uh, some specific things you, you think you're looking to get out of that summit and to make sure, you know, make it into the Kilo release? So, you know, I think as OpenStack's been maturing, you know, we've been happy with, you know, how things are, are being able to support larger scale and more stability. And so I think we're starting to look more at these new features that have just landed and are starting to mature like Trove and Sahara um, and uh, and maybe even some of these uh, auxiliary features like uh, Manila and uh, and uh, Magneto DB and whatnot. So we're, our our customers are kind of asking for that full suite of services now, and so uh, we're going to have a lot of interest about where things are going to be landing in Kilo across all those you know kind of um, uh, maybe up to stack services a little bit. And we are definitely going to be tracking the NFV uh, discussion as well. Oh, good. Okay. Kyle, what, what are your um, thoughts going into the summit, planning on Kilo? Yeah, definitely. I think NFE is definitely going to be going to be a hot area. You know, like I was saying earlier, I I, I expect there to be a lot of a lot of focus around that. Um, on on the neutron side, another big area, which is again something we've talked about, is this whole Nova Network to neutron migration story and how we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna lay that out now that we've gotten more input and and certainly hope to get more input at the summit from different users and operators around that as well. Um, these, these are the kind of the types of operational things which, which are, which are more challenging to work on from a developer perspective because we really need more input from operators and users. Um, but they're really important to those operators and users. Um, and another area you know, on the neutron side, um, where we, where we, like I was saying earlier, was this DVR functionality. We're, we're hoping to expand that a bit more in, in the kilo time frame. Um, one of the areas. Like right now, it requires OVF, uh, the virtual switch on the edge. There's been some talk of looking at supporting Linux Bridge um, for that functionality as well. So you know, these are some of the areas that, that I hope that we as a team really can discuss uh, in Paris. Okay, thanks. Um, so one of the questions from the audience was about security and just wanting to kind of get a, a general sense for um, how I guess we as a community and through the OpenSec releases are thinking about security. Um, you know, maybe Andrew, since you're you're running in production um, and are thinking a lot about security, running these mission critical apps. Um, I, this wasn't a very specific question, but I, I think if you just have some general thoughts around um, how you approach security as an OpenStack user, that might uh, be useful for the audience. Sure. So, I mean, security has been part of the paradigm shift as we move to cloud for us. So, you know, um, uh, we heavily leverage security groups. We love what we can do in security groups and that we can enable the user to manage a lot of that type of stuff. Uh, what we're doing now is spending a lot more time looking at additional tooling for both auditing and reporting around the security. But the fact that we now are living in this standardized infrastructure world with the APIs available and the data available, uh, gives us an extensible platform to kind of manage all that uh, and, and create a unified picture of what our security looks like that was actually pretty difficult for us to do before. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, enables our users. So previously, uh, kind of our, our security model was ticket-driven, and now we've enabled this via, hey, we can manage security via an API or web portal, and that, that kind of, well, does place more trust in the end user, that flexibility is also a huge win for us. Uh, and then we, the additional visibility, I think, more than makes up for the fact that we were placing more trust there. Okay, great. Um, 
Well, I think we just have a few minutes left. Um, if, you, if there are any other questions, um, please drop them into the question box. Um, you know, we are definitely excited about the next phase of OpenStack. I think we'll see, you know, more and more users um, talking at, at summits and the ops meetups and, you know, really happy that Andrew was able to join us today. Um, you know, one of the questions that we, we often get are kind of, you know, what are your uh, business drivers for using OpenStack? You know, what is the actual underlying result you're trying to get from a business perspective? And I don't know, Andrew, if I can put you on the spot there, um, but uh, I think that's just something we hear um, all the time and would be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. I think there were, there were a few things that really kind of drove us to look uh, at, at OpenStack and at private cloud. One is uh, we wanted to place infrastructure close to our customers. So we, we actually place data centers out deep in our network um, so that we can provide, you know, uh, lower latency and, and high bandwidth apps, a place to live close to our customers. And that's something that, you know, we weren't able to do on, on public cloud. Uh, and then when we started to evaluate platforms, finding an open source platform that we can collaborate on, that we can do things that are critical to our business like IPv6 and contribute back um, uh, and be part of that community was a huge win for us. Um, also, kind of the shift to the cloud paradigm where, um, you know, we we want our apps to think more in the cattle versus the pet mentality and um, and and also have infrastructure that they can deploy via self-service or via API. Those were kind of all drivers for us uh, in trying to enable this this platform and this this environment for our developers to be able to push things out quickly uh, and also have something that they can build upon and, and deliver, you know, innovative, uh, reliable apps. Great. Thank you. Well, we've just got a few minutes left, so I wanted to ask Kyle if you had any final thoughts on OpenStack Juno before we uh, wrap up the webinar today. I, I guess my, my final thoughts would be um, – this was my my first cycle as a as a PTL, so I the experience has actually been incredibly positive and and, and very exciting. Actually, the team of people that kind of work behind the scenes to make these releases happen is is really really it's impressive. It's a team of people that are global across the whole world, and and it's amazing what happens behind the scenes to make these releases happen. And you know, I, I thought I'd just give one shout out to our, our release manager, you know, engineering director at the OpenStack Foundation, uh, uh, Thierry. I mean, he, he does a great job making sure things are wrangled together, and, and uh, you know, he definitely deserves a shout out for all the great work he does to make these releases happen. Yeah, thank, thank you for saying that. I think, you know, Terry Carez um, is the release manager. If you don't know him, he's an amazing amount of work. Um, I, I was really tempted to uh, ask him to join the webinar, but, uh, you know, he – has already done Herculean efforts to get, you know, the biggest, uh, most innovative release we've ever had out the door. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd spare him, um, you know, uh, at least one little chunk of time. But thanks again to everybody that worked on OpenStack, um, and including the infrastructure team, which is a big part of uh, what makes OpenStack happen. And uh, for everybody's uh, knowledge here, as we wrap up, um, this webinar will be uh, recorded and put online shortly if you want to go back and look at it or share it. And I put the Twitter handles in the uh, live audience messaging box um, down below if you want to follow uh, our speakers today. So thanks again, and I uh, hope everybody has a good time with OpenStack Juno. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you.